My dad would say things like, you can always be proud of being Irish. Who are my people? Where is my homeland? Why do our ancestors' stories matter today? How am I supposed to grow up and have a picture of who I am if I don't know who I come from? Well, Rita, as you know, we're here in Galway today. We're on a very special mission because if you just look over the way across, across the river there, we're headed to the Galway City Museum. And in there, they've got a very special, the newest exhibition called Keepers of the Gale. And that has a lot to do with us and our ancestry because it talks about the learned families of the areas, the people who kept the Irish culture alive. And as we know, the O'Daverns of Carmack, Nocteen, Brehan Law School are our ancestors. And they're talked about in there also. Awesome. So, what do you think I'm about excited. that? I'm <laughs> excited. I can hardly wait. The timing is great. Great. So am I. Let's go. Sheila is my distant cousin and friend and a keeper of family and local history. She has taught me a lot about Irish culture and customs. We don't know exactly how we're related, but we know we are. Local history tells us that this family is likely descended from Donal O'Davern, a Brahan judge of the 16th century. Who were those Brahans? Is their story mine too? Sometimes I feel a loss, an emptiness, a longing for people unknown, for traditions never experienced, for stories untold. It's like a kind of amnesia for all that has been lost in the 150 years since my ancestors left Ireland. I wonder, do other Irish Americans feel this way? And do you know anything about your Irish history? Not really. <laughs> Well, my mom's side of the family is Irish, and I've been Irish dancing for about three years now. On my mom's side, uh, her dad died early, so we didn't really know him. We didn't really know much of the history there because we didn't have a, a link through him. I was very close with one of my grandmothers who really inculcated me into, like, Irish pride. I definitely am Irish. I don't know much about specifics. I'm not alone after all. Many of us from the U.S. don't know our stories for a whole number of reasons. Some came here escaping economic and other kinds of oppression. They were strongly pressured to assimilate and to leave their language and culture behind. Stories passed down for generations were lost or forgotten. I think collective historical amnesia is endemic in this country. My students, one of the, actually the, their favorite project in the end was researching their family history. But they would go home, and I can't tell you how many students would go home and talk to their parents, and their parents had no idea anything about their family history. We are a forward-facing nation. We have always been a forward-facing nation. And it's only if you go to the historical society, it's old people who pay attention to the past. And once we're old, it isn't as important as it is to understand the past when you're young and making decisions for the future. My grandma, Ann Davern, grew up on a small farm in the hills of County Clare, and she left behind home and country to come to America at the age of 19. Like tens of thousands of Irish, 
Anne and her sisters came to build a new life and send money home to support their family. Because she died before I was born, I never got to ask Anne about her life in Ireland or her journey to Minnesota. Two generations later, much of her story was forgotten. I had 19 years of education and not one day of Irish history, not one hour of Irish history was taught. Well, what's that about, you know? So I had to just dive in and see what I could figure out on my own. I began a search for the place and people my grandma left behind. I hoped that by learning about her life, I could understand something important about mine. My search landed me in the Burren, a wild, beautiful, windswept place where my clan, the O'Daverns, lived and farmed for over 1,200 years. My first kind of experience of the burn, I remember coming to the burn, brought by a friend, and coming over from Canvara, just as you kind of come over to the Corker area, and suddenly there is the burn, and you can see Malik off to the left, and the, yes. the, the mountains. Uh, and there was something kind of that just struck a chord me. I was born here in Raho and I went away for a long time and like the salmon I came back to where <laughs> I started from. So here I am. If you want to understand the Irish landscape and geology this is the place to do it and as a result of this geological wonder it's a UNESCO geopark for instance. All this beautiful rock has been assembled and disassembled by people for 6,000 years building these big huge stone forts these megalithic tombs where people died and were buried. They've built Fulloch Fias where food was cooked back in the Bronze Age 3,000 years ago. Everything, it's like a book written in stone. It's amazing. My sister and I first traveled to the Burren in 1977, and I visit every other year if possible. I cherish the friends I've made there. Now, I met Rita, I don't many years ago, was it? I was working at the Barn Centre, and all of a sudden this lady came in and said, is there a Daverton here? And I said, that's me, hello. And that's how we met. I can't imagine finding you here. <laughs> Do you know what, Rita? The, the, I can still remember the day that you arrived at the door here, and with a look of astonishment on your face because you expected a ruin and you had come in and you realized that somebody had bought the ruin and it was well in the way to being restored and the look on your face was amazing and you said because you've been coming for years and your great grandfather was born here that was amazing i remember i would come here and you would always, you know, feed me. Oh, like, God. I'd be next door and you'd say, we're putting your name in the pot. I always love when you come over, Rita. And you'd be back again and I'd be here. Good. You Every better. time she leaves, I feel so sad when she leaves, but I'm always here the next time you That's come. Right. This is the place my grandma left behind in 1887. Her childhood home is now in ruins. But over the years, I've become friends with the O'Gorman family who live there now. So you were born in that house, right? What? Well, actually, 14. I wasn't born in that house, no. Okay. We were born down the road, a couple of miles down the road. Uh, we owned a house about two miles down the road there. And, and this place came up for sale, then they bought this, this farm, that house up there. The early 60s, yeah, early 60s. Country living, we were farming, and I was going to school at the time, so it was coming and going every day. So we had a solid fuel stove, and there was plenty of heat in there in the winter time, nice and warm, so. My mum had chickens, and 
in Ducks and Geese and the whole lot at the time. My father used to be working and he used to be cutting hay with horses and plowing gardens. And it's not an easy life. Tough life, yeah. Anne's distant cousin, William Quindavern, was one generation older. He emigrated in 1849, making a claim on land in Minnesota just one year later. William Q's childhood home in the Burren has been restored, and its current occupant, a virtuoso named Archie, has brought a special kind of musical magic to his community. This is... Uh... The house itself here, if you, you know all about this house, um, how much it means to you, it means a lot to me too. <laughs> You're here 400 years old, I, I believe. Do you want to see a picture of, of, the, of the house? Sure. In those days? Yep. I'll just get one. Yeah. Oh my goodness. That was Liz Morahan house, do you remember that? It's impossible to separate the Burren landscape from the people who live there. There is such a wealth of archaeology going back 5,000 years. All those archaeological sites were built by farmers to keep their cattle, to bury their dead, to cook their food. The flora, that wouldn't be here were it not for the winter grazing up by cattle. So when the flowers are asleep by winter, the cattle come in the ancient custom of herding cattle up onto the mountains to their seasonal grazing lands called winterages is one such practice. These traditional ways, developed over millennia, are increasingly being revived across Europe to make farming more sustainable. Farmers like Michael Davern manage those cattle to harvest off all the dead grass without damaging the flowers then in springtime and summertime, these flowers could prosper uh, without being damaged by cattle. And so it's that combination of grazing and um, uh, transhumance that gives us this really rich biodiversity in the burn. And the rock itself, people think this is a natural feature, but it's not. The burn was completely covered with trees until farmers came, chopped those trees down, and eventually, like it or loathe it, created this bare, rocky landscape. That's also as a result of farming, so in every sense, people have shaped the landscape here. People have farmed those landscapes for generations and that's why they look like they do. If we want to maintain them for future generations, we need to support those farming communities within them. As generations of farmers shaped this rugged landscape, so did the landscape shape them. You see, when you were in the island of the horse and cart, which had gone on for many centuries, Nothing really changed. There were handheld tools, and you produced what the land was naturally able to produce. There was no such thing as no tree or anything at all. Whatever you ate was grown in your own garden. You were looking as well, you had a cabbage, your carrots, pastures, whatever. It was all there. Working this land is not easy, but its rewards are great. The Burren is uniquely suited to raising sheep and cattle, and people here have done so for several thousand years. Now, the dog has to be trained to the voice before he's trained to the whistle. She has four basic commands. She has to sit down, walk up, go left, and go right. Each dog has a different sound for the whistle. That's that great quote from Cromwell. Of this land there is not enough water to drown a man, not enough timber to hang a man, and not enough clay to bury him. But the quote went on. The tufts of grass that grow in little bunches, two to three foot square, is very nourishing indeed, and the cattle are the fattest in the kingdom. So even 400 years ago, it was recognised as a great place to produce livestock. And it's a really interesting time in the barn, because right now, the old traditional practices of farming are starting to decline because there's not really an income to be made from farming this place anymore. At the same time, the value of all these 
things like biodiversity and archaeology is increasing because it's becoming more rare. So what I think is that as farming declines in importance and as this biodiversity and heritage becomes more important, I think we need to bring, to bring farming back up by supporting farming to look after this biodiversity. The word road here in Ireland comes from an old Gaelic word called bohar. The first tracks when cattle were being moved across Ireland were the cattle tracks. So they were the first pathways. Bohar is the way of the cow, and the way of the cow is the road. All over the world you have similar situations. You have these beautiful landscapes. In a lot of the cases, they kind of depend on farming practices. So if we lose those farmers because they move to cities or whatever and get jobs, we also lose a lot of our landscape values. We lose a lot of our heritage. My father and mother, of course, were farmers. When I was young, we didn't have any fridges or anything like that. And to keep the milk cool, we had a running river by the house, just a little way from the house. And the creamery cans and the milk cows were milk in the evening. We were put into two or three creamery cans, milk, and they were put down at the river to keep them cold. But of course, that's when milk was really milk. And the cream was solid, clotted cream, about five or six inches thick on top of this milk. I got into the habit. I went down one evening and it was like nightfall. It was almost kind of almost dark. I was sitting down by the river with my feet feet in the water, you know, watching the world go by. I was, I'd say I was about eight or nine. And um, then I decided I have a cup of cream of milk up and I had a cup with me, so I took out this clotted cream and I drank down the cup of cream. I've never tasted anything so amazing in my life. I immediately was like a drug addict. I was addicted. I loved that cream. And I used to sit there in heaven drinking my cups of cream. Of course. Shortly afterwards, I stopped eating. You know, my mother had a dinner for me, come home from school. I didn't want it. All I wanted was my drug of the night, which was the cream. My mother had to gather up a few bob together and bring me to the doctor. He couldn't find nothing wrong with me. He gave me a tonic. Oh, I took the tonic. That meant I could drink more cream when I was down there at the river. So, eventually, anyhow, my mother said to me, how are you always going down to that river every evening? I said, well, I like having my feet in the water. And she went, yeah. And one night she followed me down. I was in the bank drinking my cream. Life is wonderful. She went, my God, oh, God. I was dragged up from the river. <laughs> she got to go on. Everybody with the house attacked me like you know how could you do this number one now we're losing out on the amount of cream you're drinking number two the visit to the doctor which you can never afford and now we know why i had a longing for that cream which was something terrible but then i was cut off just like that cold turkey is what it's called but life in the burn is not just about farming it has also long served as a nexus for art and creativity. What happened was it became a, a center of learning, um, a center of music, and more specifically, uh, a center where people could explore their voices. So um, I became a vocal coach. It was only after I got a chance to know Sheila's extended family that I got a clear look at what I missed growing up in the U.S. I come from Rahorn. We had we owned a small farm. We were three miles from Kilfenora village, the home of top class music. Our house was always music. Since we were children, music, music was our God. We loved it. Um, so this is the grave of my mum's grandparents, uh, Patrick and Mum's Darwin. This is where kind of all mum stories came from, from a few people inside here. Since I was a small child, I've been privileged to have my grandparents with me. 
everything I know has stemmed from them. The love I have for the area, for the history, for the geology, for everything to do with this place, and especially, of course, the family uh, tree, all stemmed from my grandparents. Uh, my grandfather, Patrick Darvin, known as Pappy, and my grandmother, Alice Galvin, who married him. They were actually neighbours, literally here to the kitchen, sort of neighbours, and they grew up together, and they eventually eloped. They started their family, they built their own house, right between the two houses, Darvin's here, Galvin's here, and there's their house right in the middle. And from then on, I suppose, I guess really all of those houses had a reputation for being, you know, places you went to and you heard stories. In fact, my grandmother's house was, I suppose, the equivalent of a Cayley house. Um, there used to be dances there on the weekend. Matches were made. Prices of cattle were discussed. Um, newspaper was read for the benefit of people who maybe couldn't read. The people came from all over. I remember my grandmother bragging that they came from as far away as Moher, which when you think about it, no cars and all the rest of it was a fair hike. And um, I grew up with all those stories. It's really cool to think that the stories came from people inside the screen. Sheila's father is a true Shanaki, a storyteller, spinning tales of all kinds that were passed down through generations, parent to child. We sit down by the fire. And my grandfather was a great storyteller. And we were all young, some of them were going to bed. I was there by the fire. He'd be telling the haunted stories. And then we'd be going like that. And he'd imitate the witch. And my, my mother said, oh, God, said, go tell him. They'll be raving tonight in the bed. They will not, he said, they will not. But I did hear all those stories to be told to him with his father. Michael even pulls out the tin whistle from time to time, a traditional instrument that carries with it the sound of Davern's past and present. There's so much history, it's amazing. It's so important to, to have them to know their background. I don't know anything if mom didn't tell me. Our, gran our granddad told me, like, I love it so much just listening to all the stories. Is it possible to find out what my ancestors' lives were like even earlier? To do that, I need to look farther back in time. We, like our ancestors, developed the main roadways or pathways which let people Communities join easily. In order to develop our Wintridges and bring it into the 21st century, we made what we call trackways, and it was in the course of making one of the, that trackway that we we came across a cyst, and there was a bit of a bone unearthed. It and we didn't think anything of it. We thought it was an animal's bone. But a geologist who happened to be around walking one day and saw the bone and recognised it to be a human bone. And it was he came to me and asked, would we mind if there was an archaeological dig done? The dig was done and subsequently the cyst was unveiled as a two and a half thousand, three thousand year old burial ground and maybe older. And the bone was carbon dated back to, uh, uh, I think it was around 5,000 years ago. I was absolutely gobsmacked. There are people around here in the Burn and throughout Ireland for 7,000 years, 8,000 years at least, and they're not all buried in our local cemetery. The rocky landscape of the Burn has preserved many mysteries of the past, uncovering stories hidden beneath the stones adds to our understanding of how people here lived long ago. Cahir Connell farmer John Davern hosts an annual archaeology dig at a stone fort located on his farm. Cahir Connell Cashel, where we are uh, right now, is a very fine example of an Irish ring fort. Now, a ring fort was 
an enclosed farmstead. Mostly built and used during our early medieval period from about the 6th, 5th, 6th century AD to about the 11th or 12th century AD. This is a very large example and even without excavation is very impressive and would suggest that it was an important place, an impressive place, maybe a high status settlement. And of course the Davern family have a long tradition in the Burren of teaching, of presenting and preserving uh, heritage. This is a map of Carragonald Townland, a map that we made of the archaeological remains. Okay. Now, we are standing just here. Mm -hmm. Carragonald, the monument of Carragonald, is this one, just behind us. Mm -hmm. It's a large dry stone enclosure, mm -hmm. but there are four of them in the townland, not just one. So there's a cluster of three here, quite close to only about 100 metres between them, uh, and a fourth one back to the west. I was excavating near part of an inner wall uh, on the southern aspect of this divider in the castle and I came across this. It's a little iron shear. It's been the adventure I've been needing, honestly. We've concentrated on excavating cutting G. As I was trawling, I immediately start picking at it in the dirt and I see a little speck of a thing like Hey, it's a little bead. It's red, white, and blue. And hey, is this glass bead uh, modern or um, antique? I, I can't tell. <laughs> and next day, lo and behold, they tell me it's a 15th century Venetian bead. I'm like, I was flabbergasted out of excitement. I was like, I did not, I didn't know. I didn't know this. Which means they were trading. They were trading, yes. That is evidence for all trade. Mm -hmm. All the way to here. The monument that we're sitting in is a high status home built in the late 10th century and built by a local ruling family. When they came here and chose this site to construct their, their new settlement, there was a particular element that they decided deliberately to incorporate into their, their new home. And we're sitting right beside it here uh, today. And this is an earlier burial mound. Small, low mound made of earth and stone that covered some stone boxes that held human remains. The burials date to the late 6th, early 7th century AD. So they're part of the earliest Christian tradition here in the Burren. The people who lived here continued to live like their ancestors had before them. Despite all of the new influences in Ireland, particularly from the, the Anglo-Normans, the occupants here, who were wealthy, and if they wanted to, could have built castles or towns or villages uh, like their Anglo-Norman counterparts. They had the, the money or the wealth to do that. They didn't. They deliberately decided not to. They had no need to. This was their ancestral home. This was their important place. They had no need of a large castle or to build a village uh, around, around their settlement. Their traditional way of life was perfectly suitable for what they needed and what they wanted to do here. What were our ancestors up to back then? The first recorded evidence of the O'Davern clan was in 800 AD. In medieval times, some served as judges of Brehan law, an ancient legal system focused on justice, restitution, and the common good. Six, six, last seven. So this idea of learned communities, I like this, you know. Very much. They <clears throat> really did share, and they came together to Absolutely. write things down, share ideas. It was more vibrant than an activity than I imagined. But yeah, it's great to think that there was that connection between all of them. There was no, you know, you didn't travel around to the other uh, uh, law schools unless there was a welcome there for you, unless it was a genuine thing, I would imagine. So there was obviously, no, this is my information. I'm holding it. So there was obviously a big sharing going on. Yeah. They were the keepers of history, and particularly they were the law keepers and the history keepers for the O'Loughlins, who were chiefs in the barn at the time. I think they were described in the, at one stage as the yellow-garbed Brehens. So apparently, when it came to issues of law particularly, they donned uh, a, a yellow gown. 
I suppose what made the Davra name so stand out was the fact of the law school. My father used to tell me about Breton laws. We used to go for a walk and he used to say, well, you know, under Breton law, um, somebody who is handicapped would there would be an injunction against making a mock of him if he was inveigled into committing some sort of crime. Then those who were sharp-witted enough to know what was happening, they were the ones that were responsible. And he used to, I can remember, he used to end up nearly everything, telling me all these very interesting things, including the fact that they, there was even women lawyers, women doctors. The most famous, I suppose, document that would be their legacy would be a collection of very early Irish laws in a text called Edgerton 88. It was originally individual sheets of vellum uh, with Breton laws, which were written by John O'Davern in the mid 1500s. This wonderful, wonderful man who's my hero, Donald O'Davern, actually marshaled all his young students to. Uh, copy as many of the laws of Ireland as they could. And these students used to put little, little comments in the margin, which are marvellous. One of them was, it's all right for him, he's out making the hay and we're indoors writing and complaining about how thick the ink was. We've always been steeped in the history of it over here. Human beings are deeply connected to their homelands this connection has been exploited by forces of oppression throughout history. Farming was everything, and property owning was everything. And back then, nobody owned property. It was all rent from the British Empire, who were the ruling class at the time of the landlord system. For over 800 years, Ireland was colonized by Norman and then British rulers. Land confiscation was rampant. 1566, Lord Deputy Sidney proclaimed, no one must maintain or keep any rhyme or barge or harp. Wow. Stamp out Gaelic Ireland. Yep, that's it. When Cromwell came, the 17th century, he destroyed yep. every single thing he came yep. upon. And all the Daverns were scattered all over the place. It wasn't only the Irish people that were displaced, but their cultural treasures as well. In 1832, the British Library bought 93 folios of O'Davern Law School documents. This medieval legacy of Brehan Law was then archived in the Edgerton Collection, number 88. Most of this document is not here in Ireland. So now the Egerton uh, document is in three locations, London, Copenhagen, and Dublin. And I believe number one should be in one location, and number two, that location is County Clare, where it originated. This is where this document should be. Are we only living for today? Do we not look back on who we were, where we came from? And that's why I think that's a very important document, that we just open up that part of our history uh, of who we were as people, and in particularly in relation to the uh, O'Daverns, it's a huge, huge uh, contribution on the part of that one family to that particular time in history, um, and I don't think it should be lost. Then came a brutal landlord system, which caused the Gaelic Irish terrible hardship. One result from this takeover of land and resources was severe poverty. Generations of subsistence farming was followed by a series of potato crop failures. The worst occurred in the 1840s. It wasn't a famine in the sense that we understand famine, a lack of food, because there wasn't a lack of food in Ireland. Um, the potato crop failed, and yes, that was the staple of the masses, because it was easy to grow and you could put it anywhere, and it People had it for breakfast, dinner and supper, and it was nutritious, and that was it. That failed. But Ireland, as a country, had so much resource-wise. There were grains, and there was livestock. 
But that was taken out of the country during the famine when it was most desperately needed. That resulted in over a million deaths and a million people leaving the country. 20 years later, during the 1870s and 80s, there was a period known as the Land Wars. There's actually a story from Kilrush about a family called O'Donnell. They had bought some grain from the local land agent. They sold it, and when it was ready to be harvested, the land agent sent in his men to harvest it for them, and then the, the men that came in decided they would store it for the family. But it ended up going to market and being sold, not by the family or for the family, and the family were evicted because they had no money to pay the rent. It's a brutally documented situation where a lot of the family died, kids died because of the eviction, and the eviction itself was a horrendous uh, situation where the mother of the family, pregnant with their youngest child, was too unwell to get out of the house and she had to be taken out by neighbours because the wreckers began to knock the house in on top of her regardless of whether she was dead or alive. That baby died as well. So when you put it in those terms, and I'm, I'm putting it just very basically here, it was bloody horrendous, absolutely. At this time, Charles Stuart Parnell and others fought for land rights with the slogan, the land of Ireland for the people of Ireland. My grandma Anne came of age during this revolutionary period, and it may be what caused her to emigrate. No individual lives in a vacuum. They live in a political, economic, and social milieu that shapes who they are and the decisions that they make. Most people are not going to leave behind everything that they know and love unless there's a really, really good reason behind it. It's important to know what the circumstances are of the country that your ancestors are leaving. All those things are really important in understanding the kind of decisions that drive people to make a big move like that. My grandma Anne, 19 years old at the time, with her two sisters and a cousin, left Ireland on the steamship SS Germanic, arriving in New York at Castle Garden in 1887. From there, it was three days by train to Minnesota, where a horse and buggy took her to a farm 3,200 miles from the one she left. It was the farm settled by her cousin, William Q. Davern, in 1850 on Dakota homeland. The Dakota are an indigenous people who have lived near the confluence of two great rivers for many generations. U.S. policy and westward expansion turned billions of acres of native land into property, all at the expense of indigenous peoples. When Anne arrived 30 years later, she found a prosperous farm and boom times for settlers. William Q. Davern was a true pioneer. He, I mean, he was settled his land in 1850. We only became a territory in 1849. Where his land was, was basically just across the river from Fort Snelling. Now, in William Q. Davern's day, there was no bridge. There was no bridge across the Mississippi at all. If you wanted to cross the river from Fort Snelling to get to the St. Paul side, you went by ferry. If you look at St. Paul in 1850, it was very limited, a nice little sleepy river town. By 1887, it exploded into a city. It was a major city. It had horse-drawn streetcars, didn't have the electric streetcars yet. It had incredible array of, of uh, commercial buildings. The 1880s was a decade where there's just an abundance of buildings going on, neighborhoods just radiating from all over the city. And so if she was riding in a carriage from the Union Depot going to the Davern House, she would be going through an urban setting. To an Irish farm girl, that journey and this Midwestern U.S. landscape and culture must have seemed strange. But Anne adjusted. She worked as a seamstress and in three years married William Austin, the oldest son from that Minnesota Davern family. My grandpa's construction business prospered, and he built a large house on Summit Avenue with his new bride. 
As was customary in large Irish families at that time, several family members boarded with them. A few years later, that business went under in the panic of 1893. The big house was lost. William and Anne moved above a shop on West 7th Street where they sold groceries. Eventually, they bought a house in that neighborhood, which still stands today. A few years later, Anne gave birth to her youngest son, William Joseph, my dad. Over the years, Anne received letters from her siblings in Ireland sharing the details of their lives. I wonder, what did Anne's letters home to Ireland have to say about her new life in Minnesota? Sometimes I imagine conversations we could have had about Ireland and my grandma's younger days. Anne Davern died in 1948, just one year before I was born. Over years of visiting the Burren, I've made friends and have learned much about my heritage. I love this place and its people. I learned so much from who they are and their lives and the way their minds work about myself that I wasn't ever able to put a finger on here um, and about my family too here. Um, there's characteristics about us that are so directly um, tied to being Irish and the whole Irish experience. These patterns, you know, they came from somewhere. They're not just quirks about individuals. They really are tied to a much bigger piece of what happened to human beings along the way. It was a shock for me to learn that many of my Irish friends don't know much about their family trees either. So much history was lost or destroyed during traumatic events of the 19th and 20th centuries. So myself, I've been tracing our own ancestors, my particular branch of the O'Davern family. Whilst there's a lot of us still around, uh, we'd more or less call ourselves sort of neighbours or acquaintances more so than family now. What I'm desperately trying to do is to link our line into the Brehan Law School line because really and truly, there is an amount of documentation. Unfortunately, most of the documentation that had we had it now that would have told us the story was destroyed during the Irish War of Independence. And uh, there's a little glitch, there's a little bit of information that I just can't tie up. I've got, I think, four generations, five generations back, and then it kind of stops. Where we live, my family live, Rahone is only like half a mile from Newville Church and we know that the O'Davern Chapel was there and the O'Davern's were corps, in other words, they, they collected tithes for the church and they looked after that side of things. That particular branch of O'Davern was traced back to the law school. So it would be just a little bit too coincidental if we were, you know, <laughs> we, we have to be connected there somewhere and I'm just desperate to find out where exactly we're connected. In order to reconnect the scattered branches of this family, we have to collaborate. Together, we can complete this puzzle. Michael Davern in Kilcorny, remember the History Center at Corfin? He went there and the old guy there that knows everything about the Daverns, he made him write down for two or three days. He wrote down everything, all the history of the, the O'Daverns going back forever. Over in Ireland, there's branches of the Daverns that they don't know much beyond their grandparents. And we know some about our branch. And I had this idea that if we hooked each other up, we could all be connected all the way back to the law school. So I've been trying to figure that out. And then we've got our chart that goes back, Michael and Jane, William and Catherine, right? And we've got, um, got it going back, their parents and their parents. Last night, I, I found a sheet from dad that I think is the missing key to everything. 
is the Kilcorny Daverns. It says Daverns of Kilcorny. So I think Dad got this from one of them. And that's my friend uh, Michael here, Michael and Liz. So that's that line. And then Dominic, he's, my dad wrote Our Ancestor. So I think that's our line. I think our great, great, great grandfathers were brothers. And the common ancestor is this Patrick and who had three sons. And I think Dominic or Patrick, I think it's Patrick, that ties William Q with Ann M is where we come together there. Gotcha. So that he's that that's really the key place. Here's Dominic, Patrick, and then it goes up to these guys. All the way back to the last one. <laughs> I think we got it. Thank you for coming. It's a great honor for me. Like some of you in this room, I've had this bug, I think that came from growing up and knowing nothing about Ireland or the Burren or my family. We just, none of it got passed down. And it was like being given a puzzle with maybe two pieces. And you didn't even have enough pieces to see what the picture looked like. And it just didn't work for me. And I sort of set out with uh, my dad and his cousin and my siblings, and we set out in the 1960s and 70s and on to reconnect with this place and people and the stories and the family. This is my grandmother, um, Ann Davern's house that she was born in in 1868. And uh, I was there last night We've stayed connected. There's been actually letters going back from that farm to my house in St. Paul for 130 years. And they're still going back and forth and we're connected to the people who live there now even though they're no, not relatives. It became clear to me early on that the real prize in all of this isn't the gravestones and it isn't the finding the lost dead relatives. <laughs> It's really the living people that I really um, love and get a kick out of, and this place means a lot to me and these people. I'd like to know how all of our families are connected, who we're connected to way back, and now with new science and DNA, we can find that out um, if enough of us get involved and do some research. How do we create a family tree for our own branch of the family, and then how do we connect those trees and it's all possible. I believe we can overcome and find a way around these things and there has to be a way to, to reconnect. There just has to be. When people experience oppression, one thing that gets erased is the memories of that group's past. The Irish people endured a thousand years of colonization and brutal occupation. A lot got lost. Daverns who have lived near each other for hundreds of years no longer know how they are related. Thankfully, that is changing. It's vitally important that you always know where you've come from. And it doesn't matter what your history has been, whether it's, it's shadowy or bright and sparkling, you should always know where you've come from. And I think that should be passed on and passed on and passed on to generations. There's been an explosion of interest in the Burren because of archaeologists, writers, and everyday people doing family history research. We are rediscovering the stories of this clan and its history. Recently, something amazing happened in that regard. The return of Edgerton 88 to Ireland for the first time in over 200 years. For a few weeks, at the Galway City Museum, descendants of Donal O'Davern were able to see this piece of their family legacy intertwined not just with the history of the Burren, but Ireland itself. And it has a new name, 
O'Davern's book. Genealogy without context to me is pointless. Individual stories are incredibly important because they are a window into the bigger story. We're the legacy of the past. If it wasn't for our ancestors, we wouldn't be here. That's the uh, wonderful thing about the burn, I think, as well, is that it's, it's attracted sort of like-minded, like-spirited people, I think. Don't you think? You know, it could be anything from botany to geology to archaeology, uh, here, music, art, writing, poetry, and it's just filled with people who have explored all these uh, artistic endeavours, almost as if there's something inspirational in the very landscape of the place itself. Getting to know the place and people from whom I come has added immeasurable meaning and joy to my life. Rita has been coming back all the time, and we've gone out a few times, and we've climbed Mullock Moor, which I shall never forget as long as I live. I nearly died on the way up. But why bother with the past? Why are Wintridges, ancient legal texts, old stone forts, and people long dead so important? The O'Daverns were but one small clan on the west coast of an island halfway across the world from where I was born. But by reclaiming this family story and sharing it with upcoming generations, we are doing what Donal O'Davern did in the 16th century, finding, preserving, and presenting a heritage that could easily have been lost forever. That's a triumph for all of us. Every one of us has an important story to tell. Who are your people? Where do they come from? I can't wait to hear. <laughs>